and what I'll be out to show now when we finish our derivation of why and how it is that national income equals consumption plus net investment. We'll see that most of the spending is actually under the heading of net investment, not consumption. And uh, that's where we want to uh, go right now. And so uh, here I am uh, at point three, uh, an accurate, what I call an accurate conception, recognizing the role of productive expenditure. And I refer you to the step-by-step uh, -step, uh, <coughs> derivation of the equality between the sum of profits and wages on the one side, which is the essence of national income, and consumption plus net investment on the other, which is net national product. And uh, we'll see why this, this equality is true, but uh, we'll see that uh, its significance is uh, badly misinterpreted, that in fact most spending uh, takes place under the head of net investment. And here we are, we got into this part way uh, last week. Uh, we begin with the uh, definitional proposition that national income, symbolized by Y, is equal to the sum of all profits and wages in the economic system. That's what national income is, the totality of profits and wages. And we understand under the heading of profits that we take profits gross of the interest that business firms pay, and we include any genuine uh, net rental incomes. Not imputed rental incomes, but uh, genuine net rental incomes, like the profit that Hertz makes when it rents its cars, the profits that landlords make when they rent out their apartments. Uh, all of that belongs under the heading of profits. <coughs> and also all of the uh, interest paid by business firms will include that with profit. So we've got the profits, uh, corporate and, uh, and individual and partnership profits, uh, all of that under P for profits, and all wages and salaries under the heading W for wages and salaries. And then all we do, you see what we're out to do, this is our starting point. Uh, here's national income, it's equal to profit plus wages. Uh, what we want to end up with, what we want to show at the end, is uh, just why and how uh, this will equal uh, consumption plus net investment. This will be step 12. We have a bunch of steps between 1 and 12. And as we get to the end, we'll see that uh, most spending in the economy <coughs> is actually productive expenditure. Uh, here's productive expenditure. Uh, B, capital B, represents productive expenditure. Well, we've already used P for profit, so think of B as representing business spending, which is synonymous with productive expenditure. And we'll demonstrate at length that uh, productive expenditure minus costs, uh, that's equal to net investment. Now, what are these uh, costs uh, symbolized by D? And it's D, not C, because we're using C for consumption. That's the uh, convention, C is consumption. So we're using D, think of deduction, and we're deducting the, the costs. All right. Uh, we start off, uh, national income is the sum of profits plus wages. But uh, what is the accounting uh, expression for profits? How do you, how do you, account, how do you uh, calculate profits? Profit is the difference between what and what? Revenue and expenses. Pardon me? Uh, revenue and expenses, or sales and costs. And here, in equation two, I say profits are sales minus costs. Yes, Ms. Danko. Can you speak a little bit louder? Can I speak a little bit louder? Okay. All right, maybe I should turn up the volume on this a bit. All right, profits are sales minus costs. Now we're uh, calculating total profits in the entire economic system. P is not the profit of uh, company X or Y. Uh, P is total profits of all firms in the entire economic system. So if we want to express uh, the profits of all firms in the economic system, uh, in terms of sales minus costs, we need to know the totality of all sales revenues in the economic system and the totality of all the costs deducted from all the sales revenues. So we could look at each firm's income statement 
each firm uh, has a, a statement showing its sales revenues uh, for a period of time and the cost that it deducts from those sales revenues to arrive at its profit. And we would want to add up the sales revenues of all firms in the entire economic system and subtract from them the totality of all costs uh, deducted firm by firm, and that will give us total economy-wide aggregate profit. Uh, any problems so far? That uh, S, S, where S stands for total sales revenues, uh, minus D representing the cost deducted from sales revenues, S minus D is profit. Well, if we agree on that, now we can substitute equation two back into equation one. And instead of saying uh, profits plus wages equal national income, we'll say in equation three, sales revenues minus costs plus wages equal national income. Any problem with this? Yes? Sales minus cost plus wages. Is national income. Sales minus cost alone is profit. But national income is not profit alone, it's profit plus wages. So uh, sales minus cost plus wages is national income. Now notice, what sales revenues are we including here? If we return to our uh, dead horse uh, bread, flour, and wheat example, uh, what sales revenues would be entering in from that sector of the economy? Yes? Uh, I don't know if you want to go over this, but I was trying to do this on the quiz over the weekend, yeah. and I was struggling with coming up with the finding the aggregate profits, and that's what two would be, right? Sales minus? Yes, sales minus cost is aggregate profit, yeah. And it was just talking about demand for customers' goods. Was consumers' goods. Money. Consumers' goods, consumers yeah. Consumers' goods, right. Yeah, okay. And then also is demand for capital goods is a thousand units of money. I was trying to figure out what is the total sales in this equation? Well, what do you think it is? Anyone have any idea? It'd be $2,000. Yeah, 2,000 units of money is total economy-wide sales revenues. Okay. Yeah. And then subtract your... Subtract whatever the total costs are, right. and that will give you aggregate profit. What did I assume? 1,800 as total costs? Or? Huh? 300. No, what did I assume for a total oh, cost? 1,700. 1,700. Okay. So then profit would be 300. All right, so now notice, in terms of uh, the sales revenues of bread, flour, and wheat, what is included in our figure of sales revenues? Isn't this finished product here? No, everything. This is everything. See, uh, are the only firms in the economy that make profits the producers of consumers' goods? Uh, doesn't uh, U.S. Steel uh, make profits? I thought your question was in regards to the bread, flour, and wheat. The yeah. Presentation of are we counting each one of those as an individually produced product or only the end product? Well, what do you think we would have to do if we want to calculate total economy wide profits well, in we the economic system? We've talked about we have to calculate each aspect of that, but that represents right. double accounting. No, that so does not represent double fallacy. counting. No, that, but I mean, that's the fallacy of what. It's a, it's a what accepted, what yeah. is accepted practices, that would be double accounting. Okay, but hopefully we laid that to rest. Maybe not. Uh, it keeps rising out of the grave. I'll have to uh, get a silver bullet and uh, <laughs> a crucifix or something to keep it down. Uh, <clears throat> but we, we want to add up the total profits of all firms, right? All right. Uh, are the uh, bakers the only firms in connection with bread? No. no. Okay, who, who else's profits would we have to add up? Farmers. Uh, the farmers, the, no. the millers, everybody, the tractor producers. All right, now, if we're expressing profits as sales minus costs, then what are the sales figures that we'd be using? The sales of each. We'd have the receipts from the sale of bread, receipts from the sale of flour, right. receipts from the sale of wheat, everything all up and down the so line. So I guess well, that's why confusion comes in on a regular basis in this whole course, is that from what perspective is the question coming from? From well, the accepted practice or from what we're well, to be? Well, the, this is an alternative uh, to the accepted practice, and what I'm attempting to do is to show how it is, how it is on the one side true that uh, national income does equal consumption plus net investment. We'll see that that is true, but nevertheless, most spending is under the head of net investment. It's productive expenditure. Now, uh, even looking at things 
uh, here we are already just in equation two. Uh, we're expressing profits as sales minus costs. And this is aggregate profit, so it has to be aggregate economy-wide sales and aggregate economy-wide costs. Uh, thinking of these things uh, is not allowed in contemporary economics. You're not allowed to look at this because what error are you allegedly making as soon as you would say total economy-wide sales revenues? Double counting. Allegedly double counting. So you can never even think of total profits in the light of sales minus costs if you adhere to that. So as soon as we're looking at total economy-wide sales, uh, we've put behind us the notion that we're dealing just with the final product. We're dealing with all the products, the so-called intermediate products as well as the final product. Yes, uh, Mr. Weatherford. You have to argue your point, but I'm thinking of a reality check here yeah. that you can't truly obtain total revenues and total costs because so many businesses are not required to report those items. Well, there might be some you couldn't obtain, but you could certainly make fairly good estimates. You can probably obtain the great bulk of them. Uh, all of the uh, major corporations, uh, their sales are a, pu a public record. And uh, however, uh, you see, the same point could be made uh, against any form of aggregate economic accounting. How is an estimate for total profits arrived at today? There are regularly published figures. Now, not everyone's uh, data is a public record, and what is done is uh, they use income tax data as a basis for estimation. And, and then there are certain things that uh, you'd have to extrapolate and uh, uh, interpolate. So one way or another, it can be done. If you can estimate aggregate profit, you could estimate aggregate sales. And we could even do it, uh, we could make some estimate uh, starting with profits, and making assumptions about profit margins. If you knew uh, uh, profits in various industries, and these figures are published, uh, if you had an estimate of profit margins industry by industry, well, all you do is you uh, take the profit margin, and you take the, the reciprocal of that, and you have an estimate of sales. And then you subtract uh, the profit from the sales, and you have an estimate of costs. So. Uh, this would not be uh, an especially difficult uh, problem. Yes, Mr. Taylor. Yes, sir. I have an uh, interesting question. So, um, to the point that was made earlier when you dialogue with Jay, a lot of the things that we're learning in this course um, are not the traditional for the contemporary right. learning. Right. So, for practical purposes, as we go back into the business world, yeah. what's the proper posture? Like, we have this. Like I've been, I've been fascinated by the fact that we've got this new thinking, right? Yeah. So Pepper and I must think, okay, this new thinking is the best, the best thinking. Well, What's the, the opinions best? expressed in this class are not necessarily those of the Pepperdine management. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Right. oh. Rephrase the question. Well, let me rephrase it. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. Coming from this, from I mean, obviously, Pepperdine is saying, listen, we're going to give you this business, you know, this, this, uh, these business courses. When you leave here, mm -hmm. you'll be better equipped to go out and have an impact in the business world. Yeah. And therefore, they must you know, embrace what you're teaching to a certain degree. Let me just finish the, yeah. the, the question. To a certain degree, obviously. <coughs> um, and so I'm not afraid of new thinking. My question is, as we go out as business persons, yeah. men, and, men and women, yeah. what's the best position to take with this thinking? How do we use it uh, by saying, listen, you know, traditionally, um, you people have been doing things like this, but that's not really right. Um, you know, it's not, using that example, it's not, you know, double counting. It, we should be considering it, you know, overall. Mm -hmm. uh, using a lot of the other examples that we've learned, what is your, your view on the best way to, I think the best for people's struggles are, how do we, how do we grab it and use it? As we well, it, it's not, it wouldn't be your job to uh, proselytize or try to convert people. You need to know a lot more than you will at the end of this class. But uh, it should be, hopefully, uh, a spur to your own further thinking and, uh, and, and search for knowledge. But uh, whatever other people are saying, you should be able to comprehend where they're coming from, mm -hmm. but uh, you should also know more. Yes, uh, This is Mr. my Mr. issue, yeah. Double counting issue yeah. with that problem, though. I, I feel <laughs> dumb at, almost asking it because That's of okay. That's sales okay. minus demand, but... Minus cost, yeah. Minus cost, right. But you... Uh, when you need to look at this problem, 
you need to think about it in a way of a double counting. You're counting it from the consumer standpoint, but before that, you're also counting it from the capital standpoint. Yeah, but that is not double counting. I know it's not. I realize it now, but that's <laughs> just kind of thinking out loud. Okay. <laughs> because it seems like a lot of people still are confused with what's double counting, what's not double counting. I, the prevailing view is that when you count the bread, or any final product, you're somehow also automatically counting everything that was previously connected with it, the flour and the wheat. That's From the seeds being bought. Yeah. Okay, all right, anything, all up and down the line. And it's thought that since you're already counting them when you count the final product, uh, you would be committing the error of double counting if you actually go out and count these other things. It's argued counting the bread is in and of itself also counting the flour and the wheat. So we've already counted everything, allegedly. And therefore, if you now go out and count in addition to the bread, the flour and the wheat, then allegedly you're double counting. Now, one of my main points is that when you count the bread, that is in fact all you are counting. And the people who think that you're counting the flour and the wheat are making two major errors in violation of the laws of mathematics. What they're doing is, they're looking at the fact that you can express the value of bread as equal to the value of the flour plus the value added by the baker. You could say uh, bread is equal to A, the value of the bread, B, the value of the flour plus the value added by the baker, or C, the value of the wheat plus the values added by both the miller and the baker. Now these are three alternative valid ways of expressing the value of the bread. But uh, if you adhere to the laws of mathematics, in all three cases, you've still expressed only the value of the bread. Because when we say the value of the bread is equal to the value of the flour plus the value added by the baker, we're not allowed to forget that part of the formulation is the value added by the baker. And if we keep that in mind, alongside of the value of the flour, what have we still got? Right. Only the value of the bread. Now, uh, those who think that we have, in addition to the value of the bread, also the value of the flour, what they're doing is dropping out the value added by the baker, which is illegitimate. That's a vi it's a, a violation of mathematical law to throw away terms of equations. You can't just arbitrarily subtract terms of equations and forget about them. So that's one error. But then after that, what they do is they add up the remainders of those equations in violation of the fact that these are mutually exclusive formulations of the same thing and therefore not subject to addition. So one could say legitimately the value of bread is equal to A, the value of the bread, or B, or, 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 the value of the flour plus the value added by the baker, or, 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 the value of the wheat plus the values added by the baker and miller, but it is not equal to the value of the bread and the value of the flour and the value of the wheat. To come up with that, you have to throw away the value added by the, bake, by the baker, throw it away twice, and throw away the value added by the miller, and then add up these remainders of mutually exclusive formulations, which are not properly addable. So uh, those are the two uh, mathematical errors involved in the view that the final product counts more than itself. And if we want to count everything, which we're obliged to do if we're studying macroeconomics, we have to count not just the value of the bread, but also that of the flour and wheat, and similarly for all other products. Yes, Mr. Wright. I don't want to return to this. That's okay. Case, but yeah. <coughs> is it... Is the thinking of a contemporary economist then that the final product, the bread, uh, because costs are passed on to the consumer, those somehow are contained then in the bread? Well, I think it's contained in the bread because you can say the bread is equal to the profit of the baker plus his cost, uh, but uh, you, you can't say that uh, the bread uh, it counts the, the bread and its cost. The bread is the profit plus the cost, which still is just the value of the bread. Now, we have uh, an amazing state of affairs. Macroeconomics is supposed to be the study of the entire economy. But the way it's presently conducted, it reduces to the study, essentially, of just consumption of consumers' goods. Now, uh, I could uh, 
teach the contemporary doctrine, I'd be teaching uh, something. If I if I didn't uh, point out what's wrong with it, I'd just be teaching something I believed was utterly fallacious, and <laughs> while I knew better. <laughs> so uh, there is such a thing as uh, academic freedom, uh, the right to pursue the, the truth and to propound it. Uh, I'm not making a secret of alternative views. And uh, you can easily access them. And I, I present them. All right, so here we are now. Uh, we're at the point where we express national income as equal to sales minus costs plus wages. It's sales minus costs plus wages. That is true. Does anyone have any problem uh, with the accounting uh, aspect of that? Anyone who doesn't see that if we took the totality of all business sales revenues for a period such as a year and subtracted the totality of the costs that the firms deduct from their sales revenues, we'd have economy-wide aggregate profit. And if we add to that all the wages and salaries, we have national income. Anyone have a problem with that? No. no. Okay, good. Now that's still national income, but as I've said, uh, you would not even be allowed to formulate it that way if you followed the uh, contemporary procedure because they never get to looking at total sales revenues. They think, but well, we can't look at that. That's already counted when we counted the consumer sales revenues. By right, now, uh, we're going to look at the total sales revenues in equation four, uh, S, and we're going to look at them from the perspective of the purchasers. Anytime a firm has a sales revenue, it has to have a customer who's spending money that constitutes the sales revenue. And there are only uh, two possible uh, motivations of the customer. Uh, the customer is uh, making his purchase either uh, for the purpose of himself making subsequent sales, implicitly out of profit, or not for the purpose of himself <coughs> making subsequent sales. Consumption? Yeah. Well, and does anyone have a problem with recognizing that any dollar of sales revenues, when looked at from the perspective of the customer whose purchases constitute the sales revenues, from the perspective of the customer, the purchase is either for the purpose of himself making subsequent sales revenues, or it is not for the purpose of himself making subsequent sales revenues. So therefore, can, for them to consume or for them to buy it as a capital good to go do something with it? Yeah, more. Uh, exactly. Uh, if we look at uh, General Motors, if we look at the sales revenues of General Motors uh, and its dealers, uh, all of those automobiles purchased uh, for personal use uh, by different individuals. Uh, under what, under the heading of what type of expenditure would you put that? Consumption expenditure or productive for expenditure? For themselves? Yeah, for themselves. Consumption. It's consumption expenditure, not for business purposes, for their own personal use. Would you repeat? Would, would, would all of those sales revenues of General Motors that are constituted by expenditures made not for the purpose of making subsequent sales. Yes. Where does that belong? Under the heading of consumption expenditure? That's clearly consumption expenditure. That's uh, sales revenues constituted by consumption expenditure. Right. Okay, now, what about all of General Motors sales revenues that uh, are made by automobile rental agencies, uh, by taxi cab fleets, uh, by business firms for business purposes? Production. Those are expenditures made for the purpose of making subsequent sales, so they are productive expenditures. <coughs> and uh, General Motors has uh, some other types of divisions. Uh, they have uh, a truck division, uh, the, uh, the, certainly their, their larger trucks. Uh, the sales revenues would be, uh, for business purposes, that would be productive expenditure. They have, uh, or did have, I assume they still do, they have a diesel locomotive division. Uh, to the extent that uh, freight railroads are buying uh, diesel locomotives, and the freight railroads are privately owned, they're business firms in business for a profit, uh, they would belong clearly under the head of productive expenditure. Yes? Question. Um, if I have a business and I purchase a General Motors product to use for my business, then I have made a production yeah. uh, purchase. Yeah, productive but, expenditure. Okay, do you, but I also use it for, for personal, so is okay. it like... Okay, is, good question. 
uh, you have a, a car which might be registered in the name of your business, but you're also using it for personal use, right. okay? Now, uh, for income tax purposes, uh, you and I will all agree it's uh, purely a productive expenditure. It's, uh, then it's, of course. It's uh, deductible. All right, but now, uh, there are uh, rules on this, uh, IRS rules, where you have something uh, that has a divided use. An automobile might be one. Uh, your home, suppose you have a home office. Uh, and let's say it's a, it's a legitimate home office. Uh, but it's not your whole home. Well, uh, how are you allowed to uh, treat that uh, on your income tax return? A percentage. So if you have a seven-room house and one room is your office, and that's for business purposes, then uh, you would uh, uh, legitimately, from the point of view of the tax code, you could deduct one-seventh of the depreciation on your home, one-seventh of the mortgage interest, one-seventh of any uh, common overall total household expenditures uh, pertaining to the house. And that would be the principle, because here you are, uh, it's one good, the house, but you're using one fraction of it uh, for business purposes and the other fraction for consumption purposes. And it's your purpose that's determining uh, whether it's a productive expenditure or a consumption expenditure and to what extent. And that's how we'd apply it. Now, uh, there are many cases, uh, businesses uh, have a car registered in their name, but that's just a cover uh, for purposes of tax deduction. So. Uh, when you report your taxable income, you're deducting that expense, uh, but in reality, it's a consumption expenditure. But uh, I'll keep it. I'll keep your secret. <laughs> uh, here we are. Uh, we have total sales revenues, and we want to look at the totality of sales revenues from the perspective of the customers whose expenditures constitute the sales revenues. And I'm saying here in equation four uh, that the totality of business sales revenues breaks down into two uh, parts. One I call S sub C and the other S sub B. S sub C is all of those sales revenues which from the point of view of the purchasers are consumption expenditures. S sub B is all of those sales revenues which from the point of view of the purchasers are productive expenditures. Mm. So uh, if we're dealing uh, with uh, General Motors, uh, its sales revenues uh, from people buying their personal automobiles for non-business purposes, that's part of consumption expenditure. The uh, sales revenues that GM has from Hertz or whoever or national car rental uh, or uh, taxi cab fleets or uh, co private corporations, that's all part of productive expenditure. The sales revenues of the steel companies would uh, virtually all be productive expenditure. The sales revenues of the iron mining concerns would be productive expenditures, and on and on. So uh, whatever sales revenues there are, uh, we will be able to classify uh, any given dollar of them as either a productive expenditure or a consumption expenditure. If it's a consumption expenditure, we call it S sub C that part of total business sales revenues which is constituted by consumption expenditure. S sub C is that part of total business sales revenues that is constituted by consumption expenditure. S sub B is that part of total business sales revenues that's constituted by productive expenditure. And we call it S sub B because P is used up for profit, so think of B as business expenditure. Uh, S sub B is that part of sales revenues paid by other business firms it's productive expenditure. But uh, let's look at the big picture that all sales revenues in the whole economy uh, do break down into two main subcomponents uh, from the perspective of the buyers. One subcomponent is uh, business sales revenues that from the point of view of the buyers constitute consumption expenditures. The other uh, subcomponent is business sales revenues that constitute productive expenditures from the point of view of the buyers. And we express that, we say total aggregate sales revenues, S, is equal to uh, S sub C plus S sub B. Can you guys see this in the far back? Uh, Mr. Boisseau, can you see this? Can you make it a little bit bigger? Let's see it. A little bit bigger. A little bit bigger? Okay. Okay. 
All right, now we do the exact same thing in equation five for wages and salaries. Uh, total aggregate wages and salaries in the economy, RW. And we look at these wages and salaries from the perspective of the employers. Uh, are the employers uh, paying these wages and salaries uh, in order for themselves to be able to make sales at a profit or not, uh, not for that purpose? Uh, to the extent that wages and salaries are paid for the purpose of the employer uh, being able himself to make sales uh, at a profit, we say that, uh, that that's productive expenditure. Those wages and salaries are paid by productive expenditure. Uh, to the extent that uh, employers are paying wages and salaries not for the purpose of making sales revenues, they are consumption expenditures. And the leading examples would be the payroll of the government. Uh, apart from that, in modern circumstances, uh, the only other instances would be uh, housemaids employed by housewives, uh, rich people's uh, personal chauffeurs and butlers, uh, things of that kind. Uh, the overwhelming bulk of wages and salaries are paid by business firms and would be classified as productive expenditures. Yes, Ms. Nikolova, consumption expenditure, in which case we call it uh, W sub C, that's the part of total wages that from the point of view of the employers constitutes consumption expenditure. And then uh, uh, all of those wages that from the point of view of the employers constitute productive expenditures, we call W sub D. So uh, total wages break down into these two subcomponents. And I call uh, these four components SC and SB, WC and WB, I call them revenue hyphen expenditure subcomponents. Why? Well, their revenues when looked at from the perspective of the sellers. Their expenditures when looked at from the perspective of the buyers. Okay, now uh, the next step is after we've gotten equations four and five, we substitute uh, those two equations back into equation four. Now equation uh, I'm sorry, back into equation three. Uh, here is equation three. Sales minus cost plus wages is national income. Now we're up to equation six, and we're substituting four and five into three. But back in three, we had simply S, and we had W. We had sales minus cost and wages. Now we have, instead of sales, we have that part of sales, which is paid by consumption expenditure, that part of sales which is paid by productive expenditure, and we're subtracting costs from the two together. And instead of just wages, we have that part of wages which is paid by consumption expenditure, and that part which is paid by productive expenditure. Does anyone have any problem with uh, equation six? Do you see that that's still national income? It's just national income is now being expressed not simply in terms of sales minus cost plus wages, but it's being expressed in terms of uh, revenue expenditure subcomponents. Uh, from two of them together, we deduct costs, we have profits, and uh, from the, the other two uh, add up to wages. Yep. Okay, so uh, we can proceed uh, beyond equation six. And now uh, we proceed to equation seven. And all we're going to do in equation seven is change the order of addition. We're just going to change the order of addition. In equation six, we, had, uh, we were still adding things up from the perspective of the kind of revenue or income. We had uh, two components of sales revenues grouped together. We had the two wage components grouped together. We had uh, sales minus costs plus wages. We were still looking at things from the perspective of the type of revenue or income that was involved, profit or wages. Now we're taking the same exact set of terms, but we're adding them in a different order. Instead of adding them uh, in accordance with their revenue or income type, we're adding them in accordance with their expenditure type. So we're grouping the two subscript C terms together and the two subscript B terms together. Uh, here we are, we still have that part of sales revenues which is paid by consumption expenditure, and we're grouping it with that part of wages which is paid by consumption expenditure. And we're grouping uh, that part of sales revenues paid by productive expenditure 
with that part of wages and salaries paid by productive expenditure. And we're moving the deduction of costs over to here. Instead of deducting it from sales revenues, we're going to deduct it from productive expenditure. Now, does anyone have any problem seeing why this is still national income? Uh, I mean, we, it, it makes no difference uh, mathematically whether we add A plus B or B plus A. It's the same thing. You can change the order of addition. Okay. Well, now all we have to do in equation eight is realize that these two uh, subscript C terms, when added together, represent total consumption expenditure, capital C. Uh, total consumption expenditure, as far as it enters into uh, aggregate economic accounting, is the sum of business sales revenues paid by consumption expenditure plus the wages and salaries paid by consumption expenditure. Together, they represent capital C. Uh, this is. Uh, consumption expenditure for goods and services purchased from business firms plus consumption expenditure and payment of wages equals total consumption expenditure constituting revenue or income. And then we do the same thing for the two sub B terms. We add up uh, the part of sales revenues paid by productive expenditure with a part of wages paid by productive expenditure and we have total productive expenditure insofar as it constitutes sales revenues or income payments. And then we substitute uh, 9 and 8 into 7. Uh, 7, recall, was, was this. Uh, we're substituting capital C for these two terms, capital B for these two terms. And so we arrive at equation 10. Uh, consumption expenditure plus productive expenditure minus D, which is the same costs that are deducted from business sales revenues, uh, these three terms uh, taken together still equal national income. We're now expressing national income <coughs> from the perspective of expenditure types. And we've got C, consumption expenditure, plus productive expenditure, minus costs, equals national income. Yes, uh, Mr. Taylor. My apologies. Could you, could you go back to eight, step eight, and just uh, try to go through it in detail, but just pro just progress this again from, from, from eight to 10. I lost this on, I, I understood why you grouped like SC with WC on seven. Yeah. Uh, but then when we went to eight, somehow I, I just kind of lost it. Okay, well. Eight uh, is simply expressing uh, S sub C and S sub B together. It's saying if we add the two together, then we can express the sum of the two as capital C. That's total consumption. Okay. Uh, total consumption is the sum of that part of total consumption, okay. which is uh, demand for consumers' goods, S sub C, okay. uh, plus that part which is demand for consumer's labor, W sub C. Gotcha, thank you. Okay, and then, then the same thing for productive expenditure. Thank you. Okay, you're very welcome. So here we are in equation 10, we have national income is equal to a sum of consumption expenditures C plus productive expenditures B minus D. Now, if you stop to think about this for a moment, if we start off, if we think back to where we started from, uh, profits plus wages, and think in terms of sales minus cost plus wages. <coughs> well, uh, all of the sales and all of the wages are either consumption expenditures or productive expenditures. And so if we have sales minus cost plus wages, and all the sales and all the wages are either consumption expenditures or productive expenditures, well, now we have uh, the consumption expenditures and the productive expenditures minus the cost. It's still the same thing. <coughs> it's just expressed differently from the perspective of the buyers rather than the sellers, and we're subtracting the same costs. So if we have uh, the same magnitudes, uh, we have the same set of magnitudes, uh, we have to have the same result, national income. Now, we have only one uh, significant step left, and that is to realize that uh, B minus D, productive expenditure minus costs, that that is equal to net investment. Now, this uh, takes uh, a separate demonstration, but I'll ask you uh, to uh, go on the assumption that this is true for a few minutes until we can uh, prove it. 
Uh, if it is true that productive expenditure minus costs is net investment, well, then what do we have? Uh, and that's expressed in equation 11. What do we get if we substitute 11 back into 10? Net income. What do we have national income finally equal to? Net cost. Consumption plus net investment. C plus I, that's consumption plus net investment. So now, here we are, we've started with uh, national income, and we've gone through a series of steps, and we're ending with uh, national income is indeed equal to consumption plus net investment, just as is claimed in all of the textbooks. That's a true relationship. They are equal, but we have vastly better insight into the equality than you'll find in any of the textbooks because we see what are the underlying, uh, the deeper elements that are generating it. And we are in a position to see the role of productive expenditure, uh, which you would never get to see otherwise. Now here uh, in 13, I give a kind of full summary uh, statement of, of the essentials of everything. Uh, we have national income is profits plus wages, which in turn is equal to uh, that part of sales revenues paid by consumption plus that part paid by productive expenditure minus cost. These three terms are still profits. And wages, that part paid by consumption, that part paid by productive expenditure. This is still profits plus wages. But then all we're doing is we're changing the order of addition we have the two sub C terms and the two sub B terms. They're taken together. We're subtracting the cost from the two sub B terms. And we have consumption expenditure plus productive expenditure minus cost. Uh, B minus D is I. And so we have C plus I. That's NNP. Uh, what remains to be done here is to show why and how it is that uh, productive expenditure minus cost is indeed net investment. Uh, let me know if I need to back up and go over anything up to this point, uh, other than uh, why productive expenditure minus cost is net investment. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, for study? Yeah. Page 701. Let me give a nice description of each formula. So yeah. as long as we focus on the flow and descriptions in this on this page, we should be okay, right? Well, you need more than this page to understand the concepts, I think. Right. Yeah. But, I mean, uh, this would be a very good review, okay. and this is good. This is good for understanding uh, what national income, the, the relationship between national income and uh, net national product. <laughs> okay, now what we have to do is uh, turn to uh, showing why it is that net investment is productive expenditure minus business costs. The same costs that are deducted from profits in business income statements. But before I get into that, I need to know uh, do I have to go over anything further? You know, at a wedding they say, uh, speak now or forever hold your peace. <laughs> so uh, please speak now. Okay. Never bought into that anyway. You never bought into that anyway. Okay. <laughs> okay. <coughs> All right, uh, let's turn uh, to the demonstration of why it is that productive expenditure minus cost equals net investment. Now, how many of you have had a course in accounting? Is there anyone who hasn't? Okay, well, that's very, very good. That will be helpful. I think the, the discussion uh, should be clear to you all. I have a, uh, a brief uh, discussion of uh, the elements of a balance sheet and income statement. And let's uh, uh, look at uh, first these elements of a balance sheet. Because what I want to try to show uh, is 
that there are some major connections between items that appear in income statements and items that appear in balance sheets. And when we understand these connections, we'll see exactly why productive expenditure minus cost does in fact represent net investment. So uh, the essential uh, bare bones assets of business firms, uh, I think are uh, first of all cash and equivalent, uh, gross plant and equipment and other fixed assets, uh, 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 less than accumulated depreciation reserve. And when you subtract the accumulated depreciation reserve, you have a uh, net plant and equipment and other fixed assets. And then uh, there's inventory and work in progress. Now, it's also <coughs> true that an important asset of business firms uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, uh, accounts receivable. Uh, we're neglecting that because that's a credit, I a credit item. If you're doing business extending credit, uh, you've got accounts receivable. Uh, it's, we're looking at things more simply than that. We don't need to get involved uh, with the credit aspect when we're first getting started understanding the essentials. So we ignore accounts receivable. The uh, essential uh, physical assets are cash, and gross plant, and, and other fixed assets, uh, the factories, the, uh, the store building, uh, the, the equipment, the, the fixtures, uh, less an accumulated depreciation reserve, that gives you uh, your net plant account. And then we have inventory and work in progress. And of course, uh, the uh, sum of the borrowed capital and the equity capital will uh, add up to these uh, two items, uh, to these various items. Now let's consider uh, how does gross plant get on the books of business? Uh, what gives rise to something being en being entered on the balance sheet as part of gross plant? Per time of purchase. It's a purchase. The business firms are buying things. Uh, if they're buying, uh, a, let's say, a new computer, uh, they paid so much for the new computer. Uh, what they paid for the computer will now be added into their gross plant account, what they paid, will be added to uh, the magnitude of gross plant. Now, if they're constructing a building, uh, they're not buying the building as such, but uh, let's imagine uh, you're constructing uh, a factory building, and uh, you're making payments as the uh, building progresses, uh, then your payments as the building progresses would be added into uh, your gross plant account. <coughs> So uh, it's expenditures, and what is done uh, with your expenditures, with your payments as the building progresses, uh, you might do it yourself if you're acting as your own contractor, or if not you, your actual contractor, uh, what would they be doing uh, with the money that you're dispensing? Paying your expenses. What would they be spending the money on? Materials. Uh, they're buying construction materials, they're paying the wages of construction labor, uh, they're perhaps renting equipment, Okay, so uh, uh, your expenditures for plant and equipment are, have a counterpart in what, in terms of other firms' sales revenues? As you're laying out money for plant and equipment, uh, or buying equipment, what does that represent in terms of the sales revenues of other firms? Well, they have sales revenues uh, to the extent you're buying equipment or construction materials or uh, renting equipment. That's sales revenues of other firms, right? Right. right. Your productive expenditure uh, that's being capitalized into fixed assets, that's sales revenues to other firms. Uh, to the extent uh, your uh, uh, outlays for the buildings are paying wages, well, that's uh, wage and salary payments. That's uh, part of the demand for uh, producers' labor. Okay, and then the uh, wage earners, presumably, will be spending their incomes uh, buying various things from uh, other vendors, and that will show up as a demand for consumers' goods. Uh, the wages you pay in constructing uh, your uh, plant and equipment, that will indirectly represent uh, receipts from the sale of consumers' goods when the wage earners uh, consume their wages. <coughs> now, uh, in your income statement, uh, one of the items that appears in virtually every income statement is depreciation. Uh, depreciation is one of the deductions from sales revenues. It's part of the costs deducted from sales revenues. Now that much we all know. But uh, that same depreciation that appears in business sales revenues as an income statement item uh, also uh, has an effect 
on their balance sheets. And how does it show up on the balance sheet? It comes off the assets. Pardon me? They reduce the assets by virtue of being added into the accumulated depreciation reserve. Uh, so let's work uh, a simple example. Uh, let's suppose we have a firm that uh, uh, spends a million dollars buying new computers in the first quarter. All right, uh, where will that million dollars go uh, on this uh, hypothetical balance sheet? Uh, okay, it goes under the heading gross plant and equipment. So they're, they're spending a million dollars for uh, computers. That's part of productive expenditure and it's added into, debited into, gross plant and equipment account. Now, let's say that uh, this is their only expenditure of this type for the year, and that they're using these computers for the full year, and we'll assume the computers are depreciated over a three-year life. Okay, what would be the income statement charge accompanying the expenditure of a million dollars for new computers? Okay, 333,333. That would appear in the income statement as a, a, a cost item. And how does it appear in the balance sheet? It's an addition to accumulated depreciation, right? Okay, so we would have a million added to gross plant and equipment and 333,000 added to accumulated depreciation reserve. What is the effect on the net plant account for the year? It's plus the difference, uh, 66667. Uh, so uh, here we are. Uh, we've added a million uh, in productive expenditure for plant and equipment, and we've added 333,000 in current depreciation, and there's an implied effect on the balance sheet, and that is the net plant increases by the difference, 666667. Uh, now, why is this? Well, productive expenditures for plant and equipment are additions to the gross plant and equipment account on the balance sheet. Depreciation cost is an addition to the accumulated depreciation reserve, which is subtracted from gross plant to give you net plant. What is the effect on net plant uh, to the extent we're adding uh, to gross plant and incurring depreciation? Well, net plant will increase to the extent there's a positive difference. So if, the, if we're spending a million for new plant and equipment and we have depreciation of uh, 333, 333, uh, net plant will increase by the difference. Well, notice this represents net investment in plant and equipment. Uh, the net investment in plant and equipment is the increase in the net plant. Net investment in plant and equipment is the increase in the net plant. And the amount of that is the difference between the current plant and equipment spending and current depreciation. Any problems with this? That productive expenditure for plant and equipment minus depreciation cost is equal to net investment in plant and equipment. Yes, Mr. Wright. So if you, if you depreciate a piece of equipment over a one year period, you would have a zero. If, if we depreciated the computers in 100% in one year, we would then spend a million in that year, and we'd have depreciation cost of a million on their account, and there would be a zero net investment in plant and equipment. Okay. That would be true. Now, notice also, uh, suppose uh, we have computers available this year that we purchased the year before, and we're not making any new purchases, but we're incurring depreciation. And we have the fresh 333, 333 of depreciation. What's the effect on our net plant account? It would decrease by the amount of depreciation. So uh, depreciation operates to reduce the net plant account. Plant and equipment purchases operate to increase the net plant account. The difference between the two is the change in the net plant account. The difference between the productive expenditure additions uh, to gross plant and the depreciation additions to the accumulated depreciation reserve that's the change in the net plant account. The depreciation is a subtraction. The expenditure for new plant and equipment is an addition. The difference between the additions and the subtractions is the net change. Now, if we look at the bare bones elements of an income statement, uh, we've got uh, depreciation. We also have cost of goods sold. And we have uh, selling general and administrative expenses. 
and after we subtract these three, we have a net profit before taxes. Yes, Mr. Sweeney. Uh, so you're saying basically the delta net plant is equal to the investment. So in the case where we took computers from last we purchased last year and appreciated this year, there was no further purchase of equipment than your investment is minus three thirty three. Yeah, if you have if you're incurring depreciation and you don't have current new expenditures. Uh, your net plant is shrinking, your net investment would be negative. You can have negative net investment in plant and equipment. That, that exists any time uh, depreciation surpasses new spending for plant and equipment. So the investment is the delta net? Would be negative. You can have negative net investment. That occurs any time uh, depreciation surpasses current plant and equipment spending. But not balance. Pardon me? Spending, but not balance. But not the, ba the balance sheet is not negative. Uh, you have a negative net investment if the net plant and equipment uh, account gets smaller. It's still positive on the balance sheet, but less than it was the year before. So that's a, a negative movement. It's a reduction. All right, so we have uh, these further elements of cost. Uh, we've looked at depreciation. Uh, it's a cost item. It's also... Uh, a factor that enters into the balance sheet that <coughs> operates to affect uh, net plant and equipment investment. And we also have cost of goods sold and selling general and administrative expenses. Now, uh, on the balance sheet, we also have inventory and work in progress. That's the item that relates to the cost of goods sold. Now, notice uh, when firms are making expenditures on account of inventory, like suppose we look at some outfit like the sofa factory. I think they're a retail establishment. Uh, let's say uh, the sofa factory uh, spends a million dollars buying sofas at wholesale from sofa manufacturers. What's the accounting treatment of that? How does that appear? To, would they uh, take their million dollar outlay and say, Oh, well, that's a cost we're deducting from sales revenues because uh, we've spent a million dollars. It's inventory. It's inventory. It's debited. It's debited, added to inventory. The money that uh, a retailer spends uh, to buy stock, uh, his merchandise, from a wholesaler, that's uh, an addition to his inventory. Uh, if you have a manufacturing firm, uh, what they're spending uh, for materials to put in their warehouse, uh, that's uh, 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 an inventory expenditure. That's a productive expenditure on account of inventory. Uh, uh, large firms have uh, uh, accurate cost accounting systems. Uh, so not only would outlays for materials be going into inventory or work in progress, but so too would the wage payments of manufacturing labor, at least the direct labor. Imagine uh, General Motors is uh, uh, spending a certain amount of money uh, for steel sheet, and it's also paying wages uh, to workers in its factories who are processing the steel sheet and the other inputs that are purchased. Uh, but uh, even after some processing has gone by, uh, General Motors now has uh, a supply of semi-produced automobiles. It's not just the raw materials, uh, it's automobiles uh, at different stages of manufacture, or they've got uh, an inventory of automobiles sitting in their lots. Uh, how would they be calculating the uh, cost value of those inventories? It would include the, the wage payments along the way as well as the outlays for the materials. So uh, outlays uh, uh, by business firms uh, for materials, components, supplies, and wage payments, at least to manufacturing labor and in construction firms, to construction labor, uh, these are wage payments that are uh, debited into uh, asset accounts. So notice, here we are, we're now in the month of November. Uh, General Motors and other firms are making current outlays uh, to buy from their suppliers. Uh, they're meeting payrolls. Uh, when do you think uh, the automobiles that they're turning out uh, uh, now and next month in December, uh, when do you think they're going to actually get into the hands of the automobile buyers and be paid for? Probably sometime early next year, January and February. But General Motors uh, probably has a fiscal year, I think, that ends December 31st. 
So when they uh, uh, calculate their income statement for 2004, and it turns out that uh, in November and December, uh, they've paid however many billions of dollars for various materials and wages and so forth, but they haven't yet sold that resulting output, uh, where would those outlays show up? Would they be in the income statement as a deduction from sales revenues? They'd be on the balance sheet as additions to inventory or work in progress. They'd be inventory work in progress. Now, when you uh, look at General Motors' income statement and they report a figure for cost of goods sold, what does that represent? Pardon me? Yes? Yeah, it's, it's something that's coming out of inventory. Uh, when, when it's in inventory, there's an inventory value. The inventory value is based on the sums previously expended for the materials and wage payments and so forth. Uh, but until it's sold, that's an asset item. It resides in inventory. Only when the item is sold is the cost rung up. Then it's a, de a deduction from sales revenues as a cost, but what is its effect on the inventory? Reduces. Reduces. It equivalently reduces inventory. So notice, if you look at income statements and you see the item cost of goods sold, well, on the one side, that's a deduction from sales revenues in arriving at profits, right? But in the balance sheet, it's also a deduction from what? The inventory work in progress account. So notice, uh, cost of goods sold has this uh, dual relationship. It's an income statement item, and it also enters into uh, the balance sheet uh, determination of inventory work in progress. Now notice, when firms are making outlays for materials, components, supplies, uh, paying the wages of manufacturing labor, uh, their expenditures are not entering into their income statement, not right away they're being debited into this asset account, inventory work in progress. It's only as you have cost of goods sold that uh, you have an item in the income statement, and then it's a subtraction from the balance sheet. Well, this implies, I think, that uh, the difference between the sums firms expend uh, for inventories, supplies, components, and the wage payments of manufacturing labor, the difference between all that on the one side and cost of goods sold that's the difference between pluses to inventory work in progress and subtractions from inventory work in progress. The productive expenditure on account of inventory work in progress is an addition to the inventory work in progress. The cost of goods sold is a subtraction. Well, what does this difference signify? Suppose we have an operation that's spending uh, in the uh, given year that has outlays of $10 billion on account of inventory work in progress. That's its total outlays for materials, components, supplies, and uh, direct labor of the kind that they debit into inventory work in progress. And it has cost of goods sold, we'll imagine, of $9 billion. What does that imply about the effect on the value of their inventory work in progress? It's plus $1 billion. You see, whatever they had, they opened the year with a certain value of inventory work in progress. If they spend $10 billion or whatever it might be uh, buying materials, components, supplies, uh, paying the wages of manufacturing labor, all of those sums are additions to this asset account. And to the extent that the firm is making sales out of its inventory, we have cost of goods sold, and the cost of goods sold is the subtraction from the inventory work in progress account. The difference between the sum of additions and the sum of subtractions is the net change in inventories. That's net investment in inventory. So notice we have now uh, a close connection uh, between, uh, well, we've looked already at the two grand components of net investment. Net investment in the whole economy has two components. There's net investment in plant and equipment, and there's net investment in inventories. Net investment in plant and equipment, and net investment in inventories. And here we can look at the whole picture. Uh, we're out to show that productive expenditure minus cost equals net investment. <coughs> Here's the totality of productive expenditure. 
uh, here's the totality of costs and uh, the difference is net investment. Now what we have done uh, up to now implicitly is we're looking at uh, productive expenditure on account of plant and equipment, call that B sub 1. Productive expenditure on account of inventory work in progress, call that B sub 2. Uh, D sub 1 is depreciation cost. D sub 2 is cost of goods sold. And what have we got? What's the difference between B1 and D1? Productive expenditure for plant and equipment minus depreciation cost, that's what? I asked what I wonder. Which is? Net investment in what? In plant and equipment. That's I sub 1. Uh, B sub 2 is productive expenditure for inventory work in progress and D sub 2 is cost of goods sold. What's the difference between those two? Net investment in inventory, I sub 2. I sub 2 is net investment in inventory. Now, we have a third category here, uh, B sub 3 and D sub 3. What are these? Well, uh, in contrast to plant and equipment spending and spending on account of inventory work in progress, there are some productive expenditures which are not debited into any asset account. These are expenditures which are uh, deducted instantaneously as costs. Uh, typically in this uh, category would be such things as newspaper advertising, uh, possibly uh, the uh, payment of the salaries of executives and clerical workers, uh, though not necessarily always. Uh, let's suppose uh, General Motors has an advertising campaign in the last week of December not just newspaper, any television advertising, whatever. And uh, in their uh, Christmas advertising, uh, they spend $100 million, or however much. And they have to have an income statement as of the close of December 31st. How would that $100 million advertising expenditure show up? Uh, that would not be cost of goods sold. Well, that would come under the heading of selling general and administrative expense. Selling general and administrative expense, and that kind of expense is what I would call an expensed expenditure. Unlike uh, plant and equipment spending and inventory work in progress spending, it's not, edit, it's not debited into any asset account. It's charged off uh, instantaneously. Uh, if you had an income statement uh, uh, that you had to post as of midnight tonight, then whatever outlays had been made uh, since the last such income statement and midnight tonight of this character, uh, they would appear as uh, an expense item. They'd be part of the costs of that uh, period. So if, if we had advertising uh, today or last week, uh, since our last uh, income statement, uh, those outlays would be deducted immediately. Now I call uh, such expenditures uh, expensed productive expenditures. They're expensed productive expenditures. These are the productive expenditures that are costs instantaneously. They're costs the instant that they're made. They appear in the income statement as a cost in the moment they're made. Now, if that's the case, and we subtract from these productive expenditures costs of an equal amount, the costs equal to those productive expenditures, what's the difference? Zero. They net to zero. Well, here we are uh, between uh, B1, B2, and B3. We have the totality of all productive expenditures. And between D1, D2, and D3, we have the totality of business costs. And we, when we subtract the totality of the one from the totality of the other, what do we get? We have net investment. We have net investment. We have uh, I1 plus I2 plus zero. That's I1 plus I2. Productive expenditure minus the same costs that business firms deduct from their sales revenues in calculating profits. When you take those same costs and deduct them from productive expenditure, you have net investment. <coughs> Any problems on this? <coughs> Now, under each of these types of productive expenditure, uh, you have uh, uh, some of it will be productive expenditure that constitutes business sales revenues. Uh, some of it will be productive expenditure that constitutes wages or salaries. Under B1, uh, we have productive expenditure for construction materials. Well, what is that from the point of view of the sellers? Sales revenues. 
We also have uh, the payment of the wages of construction workers. That's a wage or salary payment. Under B sub 2, we have uh, the purchase of materials, components, and supplies. Well, that's uh, sales revenues to the sellers. And we also have uh, substantial wage and salary, w wage payments anyway, uh, maybe some salary payments too. That's wage and salary payments. Under uh, B sub 3, uh, we have, again, uh, selling general and administrative expenses. What would be examples of the purchase of capital goods, uh, receipts from the sale uh, of capital goods, under the heading of uh, selling general and administrative expenses? What types of purchases from other firms uh, would show up uh, as uh, a selling general and administrative expense from the point of view of the buying firm? Rent. Well, possibly rent, maybe. maybe. What? Uh, office. office supplies. Probably the electric bill, uh, lighting and heating expense, advertising. Uh, lighting and heating, advertising, that represents sales revenues to the sellers. Uh, paper clips, rubber bands, uh, those are uh, simple office supplies. Uh, you'd almost certainly expense them. So uh, these would be expense, uh, productive expenditures, uh, and their uh, receipts from the sale of capital goods. They'd be under S sub B from the point of view of sales revenues. And uh, uh, the wages of clerical workers, uh, perhaps sales help, uh, they would probably be, uh, well, they'd be S sub B also, uh, W sub B, uh, but they would probably be expense. They'd be under uh, B sub 3. Mm. All right, well, I think uh, we've shown then that uh, productive expenditure minus costs, the same cost that we subtract from sales revenues to get profit, that's net investment. That's net investment. Uh, let me uh, say one last point about the relationship between productive expenditure and costs. Uh, people who don't know anything about accounting uh, tend to ignore the difference between productive expenditures and costs. There are certainly uh, strong connections, but uh, when you allow for uh, assets that business firms have, the plant and equipment, the inventories, uh, a major chunk of productive expenditure uh, you can think of as being parked in asset accounts. Uh, they're parked uh, in plant and equipment accounts or inventory work in progress accounts. They show up as costs uh, after an interval of time. They show up in costs as and when goods are sold and as and when the assets are aging or wearing out. They don't show up in costs instantaneously. Today's productive expenditures, uh, to the extent they're for assets of one kind or another, you can think of as being uh, costs appearing in income statements in the future. The costs that appear in income statements today are, to a large extent, uh, productive expenditures made in the past. And whenever we have uh, more productive expenditures being made in a given period, then uh, costs uh, being incurred in that period, we have net investment. Net investment is the difference between the productive expenditures, which are uh, added to assets, and the costs which are being subtracted from assets. Yes, Mr. Wright. I have one, one question. It, suppose you depreciate something over three, five, ten years, it yeah. doesn't matter. But at, at, that, at some point, then, it, it, it's no longer, um, and you're not reinvesting, it's no longer a net investment. The only thing I would say is sometimes equipment is depreciated fully mm -hmm. after three years, yeah. yet it's still in service five right. years from then. And it's, I mean, it's no longer considered a productive expenditure, but you're still <laughs> garnering you know, revenue from Right. Okay. So now when you have assets that are still in use, even though they're fully depreciated, they'd still appear on your uh, balance sheet as part of gross plan, and right. the total depreciation would be in the accumulated depreciation reserve, and they, uh, they, they presumably would be contributing something to revenue, but they are fully depreciated. Uh, they would only disappear from the balance sheet when they were retired. Right. So if you're no longer using them, if you scrap them, if you sell them, uh, then you deduct them from the balance sheet. You blow them up. Like Hazlitt. But yes. Oh, I'm sorry. You had a question first. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, now, in your um, equations here that we're talking about, yeah. do you, are, are we going to have to worry about, I mean, 
I, I'm just wondering, in your contemporary economics course, they always tell you to calculate in you know, the opportunity cost of everything. And so I'm wondering, is, it, is that going to come with, uh, later on? Or are we going to talk well, about that? I, or? I don't think I'll give you anything that breaks it down to this detail, but uh, you will get questions. If productive expenditure is X and uh, costs are Y, uh, what is net investment? Yeah, you'll, that you'll have to know. You should know that productive expenditure minus cost is net investment. But not opportunity cost. No, we're not dealing with opportunity cost. In fact, hopefully, if you review that section, uh, you'll see that uh, uh, I attempt to uh, refute that concept. It's out the window. All right. Well, don't put it out of the window, but uh, keep in mind what it is and also what is wrong with it. All right. Okay, now, I'm sorry, Ms. Herrera. Okay, that's a good question. Uh, you're leasing copiers or whatever. Maybe you're leasing furniture. Uh, you're leasing uh, uh, your uh, storefront. You're leasing the store. All right, uh, from your point of view, uh, uh, what you've paid would be an expense, uh, would be a deduction in your income statement. I think it would appear under the heading selling general and administrative expenses. I don't think there'd be any element of capitalization involved. But the party who'd be charging the depreciation would be the owner of the assets. So if you're renting a space in a building, uh, you're not depreciating, but the landlord is. Uh, if you're renting copying equipment, you're not depreciating it, but the uh, copying company is. They're depreciating their equipment. Uh, it's, the owner, it's the owner of the equipment who depreciates it. Okay, you're welcome. All right, now, I have a reference here, uh, net investment as the tip of the productive expenditure iceberg. Uh, if, you, if you recognize that uh, net investment is, in fact, productive expenditure minus costs, that it's this enormity of expenditure. Uh, under the head of productive expenditure, we have the spending for the flour and the wheat, uh, the spending for the steel sheet and the iron ore, and all the rest of it. And uh, net investment is the difference between the totality of all of this spending, uh, together with wage payments paid by business, and the cost that businesses deduct. Well, uh, this difference is going to be much, much smaller. The difference is net investment. But net investment is the difference between two huge sums. Now, it might be, uh, would it be possible, do you think, that we could have a year in which uh, productive expenditure and costs happen to be the same. Yeah. Would that be possible? Yeah. I would think it would be possible. Uh, would it be possible to have a year in which a productive expenditure was less than the cost? Yeah. Yeah. That would be possible too. In that case, net investment would be a negative number. But let's uh, for the moment say that productive expenditure and costs are equal. Then net investment would be zero, right? And national income would then equal consumption alone. It would be uh, mathematically equivalent to consumption alone. But still, where would most of the spending be? Uh, uh, productive expenditure under the head of net investment. Uh, when you look at uh, net investment, it's zero, but that would be the difference between two huge items, uh, a huge amount of productive expenditure and an equally huge amount of costs. Now, uh, in a normal year, uh, we have positive net investment, but uh, it doesn't begin to indicate how large productive expenditure is. Uh, you might have, uh, in a given year, uh, $10 trillion of productive expenditure and $9 trillion of costs, and we'd have net investment of $1 trillion. Or it could be uh, uh, $10 trillion of productive expenditure and $9.9 .9 trillion of net investment. But still, we have this $10 trillion of productive expenditure. That's actual spending. Now, uh, <coughs> let's, well, I see that we're uh, just like a minute shy of our normal break time. So let's take a break here, and then we'll be able to use this framework and see where the actual spending is going on. So I'll expect you all back in 25 minutes.